Hello everyone and welcome to our review of the AMC 10B. Before I begin going through the questions, I just want to say a couple of things because I realized that there were a surprising number of you who watched my review for the AMC 10A, um, including many of you who are not from Singapore, where I'm from. Um, there were some, most of you from the United States and from various countries around the world. So thank you for watching. I hope you found the previous video helpful. And I also just want to say for those of you from the US where this AMC does hold quite a bit more weight for you in um, the IMO qualification pathway or whatever um, other intermediate goals you have. So I think this year's AMC has been pretty much um, agreed upon that the AMC, especially the AMC 10A and 10B, were more challenging than many of the previous years. For those of you who did a lot of practice, you may have scored a bit lower on this year's one as compared to all the preceding year's mock papers you have attempted. And so my message would be that from a very practical standpoint, don't be too discouraged because everyone is saying the same thing, the cutoffs for the AIME or for distinction on a row or whatever other target you might have might be a bit lower than you expect. At the same time, from a mathematical standpoint, I think this year's questions were difficult uh, in some way because they were quite unusual. And I think unusual questions are kind of fun. You get to at least see something that isn't just the 50th version of the exact problem type that you have been doing so many times over and over again. So it's okay. If you didn't manage to solve it now, you definitely learn something new. Obviously, there are still one or two questions which are not so much difficult as just a bit annoying, but that's the nature of the AMC, which is still a speed contest to some degree. Um, some of the questions are not difficult, but are just meant to be a massive time sink. And so um, competition tactics come into play where you decide, is this worth my time? Is this not worth my time? But from a mathematical standpoint, I think there were quite a lot of questions which were interesting enough this year that we can have some fun discussing together. So I'm going to go at a slightly slower pace than I did for the AMC 10A because I realized that even though I spent quite a bit of time on the later half and less on the first half, um, there were many of you who may have uh, gotten stuck on maybe the question 6 to 15 kind of range. So I will go through it a bit more slowly. Um, but if you're watching this video and you are only interested in the last five questions, feel free to skip ahead as some of you may already be intending to do. Alright, without further ado, let's begin with question one. Um, what is the value of this sum? Uh, you can either look at each place value and see that it is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And so there will be a carryover of 1 each time until your final answer is just 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Or nothing stopping you from just doing addition normally. So this is question one. I don't think I should say too much further about it. Question two, what is the area of the shaded figure shown below? Um, you have two reasonable choices. Either you take a big triangle minus this small triangle, or you can split it into half, which I think I will just split it into half. So the area of each of these triangles would be half times the base, which is from two to five. So length is three, and then the height is from three to five. So the length is two. And then there are two of these triangles, which are symmetric. So half times three times two times two is equal to six, which is option B. Question three, um, the expression 2021 over 2020 minus 2020 over 2021 is equal to the fraction P over Q, uh, where P, Q are positive integers uh, with GCD one, what is P? I would say again, there are two options you can take. One option is to do it directly, subtract fractions as you normally would. And if you did that normal subtraction, you would get something like this. Now, in order to simplify the top, we can use our difference of squares factorization. 2021 minus 2020 
2021 plus 2020 over 2021 times 2020. Obviously, the first factor is 1, so this simplifies to 4041 over 2021 times 2020. So it's pretty easy to see that um, there are no common factors in the top and bottom because if anything is a factor of 2020, it should be a factor of 4040. And if anything is a factor of 2021, it should be a factor of 4042. So you can't have any common factor with 4041. Okay, and alternative, just to quickly mention, would be to write the first one as 1 plus 1 over 2020, and the second one as 1 minus 1 over 2021. If you did that, you would get 1 over 2020 plus 1 over 2021, which would give you the same conclusion, but perhaps avoiding the need for the difference of squares. Question 4. At noon on a certain day, Minneapolis is n degrees warmer than St. Louis. At 4 o'clock, the temperature in Minneapolis has fallen by 5 degrees, while the temperature in St. Louis has risen by 3 degrees. Okay, so Minneapolis and St. Louis are n degrees apart. Now, at 4 o'clock, Minneapolis dropped by 5 degrees and St. Louis goes up by 3 degrees. So the gap is going to be now n minus 8. Right, so the gap is n minus 8. And they say that they differ by 2 degrees. But take note that it doesn't say which one is higher. So all possible values hints at the fact that there may be two ways of this happening. So n minus 8 could either be 2 or minus 2. So n is 10 or n equals to 6 and our answer is 60. Okay. Question 5. Let n equals to 8 to the power of 2022, which of the following is equal to n over 4? Looking at all the options, you will see that all of them have base either 2, 4, or 8. And 4 and 8 are also powers of 2. So I think it's reasonable to write the whole question in terms of the base 2 and then see what happens after we simplify. So n is 2 cubed to the power of 2022, which is 2 to the power of 6066. n over 4 is n over 2 squared, so it would be 2 to the power of 6064. Now 2 to the power of 6064 is not one of the options, which means that you can try to write it either as a power of 4 or a power of 8. Now I can write this as 2 to the power of 2 times 3032, which is 4 to the 3032. And we can see that is option E. So if this didn't work, we would go and look at base 8, but um, 4 works, so that's good enough for us. Okay, question 6. The least positive integer with exactly 20, 21 distinct positive devices can be written in the form m times 6 to the power of k, where m and k are integers and 6 is not a device of m, what is m plus k? We know that 2021 is 43 times 47. If you're taking the AMC, you probably know this too well. And this is the second one that has been held this year. So you have seen the year 2021 pretty much overused to the extent where 43 and 47 are burned into your heads. So if it is 43 and 47, it means that your factorization could have two different forms. It could look like p to the power of 2020, which certainly could not be the smallest one. Um, or we can have p to the 43 minus 1, which is 42, and q to the 47 minus 1, which is 46. So 42 and 46 would be the exponents in your prime factorization. 
Now to make this as small as possible, P and Q must be distinct primes, so you want them to be 2 and 3. And that's where 6 comes from. However, you also want to make sure that your 2 is the one that appears more times. So you're going to make Q be 2 and P be 3. So let's rewrite it in the form that they want. 2 to the 46 times 3 to the 42. You can take out 2 times 3 to the 42. And we still have another 2 to the power of 4. So 6 to the power of 42 times 16. And that would be K is 42. M is 16. 42 plus 16 is 58. Question 7. Call a fraction A over B not necessarily in simplest form, especially if A and B are positive integers whose sum is 15. Uh, how many distinct integers can be written as the sum of two not necessarily different special fractions? Okay, I think this question uh, is one that, because of its placement, becomes artificially difficult. Because you believe that if it's at question 7, there should be a very simple method to do it. There is a simple method in terms of uh, mathematical complexity, but in terms of the amount of work, it maybe is a bit more than you would expect. Because I think all we can do is just some listing. Okay, so let's list some of these out. We should know how many there are before we start listing. Uh, and it will start from 14 over 1, uh, 13 over 2, 12 over 3, 11 over 4, and I'm really going to list all of them down. Now, the reason why I'm going to list all of them down is because you will quite immediately see that some of them have no business in being combined with anything else to give you a whole number. So usually before you start listing, just ask yourself, how bad is this going to be? Uh, and if the listing can be done in less than 30 seconds, um, it isn't that bad. So this, I will simplify a bit. This is six and a half, this is four, this is two and three fourths, this is two, this is one and one half, one and one over seven, uh, seven over eight, um, two over three, one half, four over eleven, one over four, two over thirteen, and one over fourteen. Now the only ways that you can get an integer is that you are either doubling one of these that can be doubled or you're combining two of them where the fractional parts kind of neutralize one another. Okay, so let's start with the ones that are integers, which is 14, 4, and 2. So you can have 14 times 2, which is 28. You can have 4 times 2, which is 8. You can have 2 times 2, which is 4. And you can have 14 plus 4, 18. 14 plus 2, which is 16. And 4 plus 2, which is 6. So those are the ones that come from just the integer ones. Now, there are also those that come as a 1 half. So those that come as a 1 half, you can double them or you can combine them together. So I'm going to check those. Now 2 times 6 and a half is 13. 2 times 1 and a half is 3. And 2 times 1 half is 1. We can also add them. 6 and a half plus 1 and a half is 8. So that's repeated. 6 and a half plus 1 half is 7. That's not repeated. And as we're doing this, we're kind of happy because we can see that this is the 10th one. The next one I'm going to write one and a half plus half is the 11th one. So we are carefully writing it down and we are kind of chomping off options. So as each one that we write down, we are eliminating the smallest ones. So even if we stop at 12, um, the worst case is that we, are, we have left out one and it's 13, but we know 9, 10, 11 are definitely wrong, for example. So this is progress. Okay, so what else do we have apart from these? Well, the ones that are on their own. 
over 14, over 13, over 11, over 8, over 7 have no chance of possibly being combined. There is the 2 and 3 quarter and 1 quarter, but those also sum up to 3. So we can say that it can't be combined any other way. And likewise, 2 thirds can be combined with anything else. So all in, we have got 11 options. So as I mentioned, I'm talking through these a bit more slowly than I did previously. But if you have gotten the approach and you're taking the AMC, you can fly through this maybe 30% or 40% faster than how I'm writing this out. Just do it at a pace where you think you're not going to make a bunch of silly mistakes. I think statistically speaking, we can't avoid having one or two careless mistakes or weird silly errors, but we hope that it doesn't happen too much. That's all we can do. All right, question eight. And the greatest prime number that is a divisor of 16384 is two because 16384 is two to the power of 14. What is the sum of the digits of the greatest prime number that is a divisor of 16383? And when you see that 16384 is given as the example, and then now you're 16383, this isn't just a matter of giving you a completely pointless and irrelevant example. It is kind of helping you by telling you the factorization of this is 2 to the 14. So this is 2 to the 14 minus 1. Since we are looking for the greatest prime factor, we are hopefully going to factorize this. So using difference of squares, oops, not 17, but 2 to the 7 minus 1 and 2 to the 7 plus 1 is a factorization. This is 127 and this is 129. 129 can further be factorized into 3 and 43. So 43 is one of the prime factors. But if you check 127, 127 is also a prime factor. So it is a prime factor. It clearly is the greatest one. And so the sum of digits 1 plus 2 plus 7 is 10. Question 9. The knights in a certain kingdom come in two colors. Two over seven of them are red and the rest are blue. All right. Furthermore, one sixth of the knights are magical and the fraction of red knights who are magical is two times the fraction of blue knights who are magical. What fraction of red knights are magical? Okay, this is um, interesting. Let's draw a table because there are two different conditions. There is uh, red and blue. Um, and I'm just going to write down the ratio 2, 7 and 5 over 7. So 2 is to 5. 1, 6 of the knights are magical. So magical and not magical. 1, 6 and 5, 6. Now the fraction of red knights who are magical is 2 times the fraction of black knights who are magical. So essentially we are only looking at this left column. Now I'm going to just normalize everything. 2 plus 5 is 7 and 1 plus 5 is 6. So the lowest common multiple is 42. Uh, so I'm going to write it as 7 is to 35 and multiplying by 6 as 12 is to 30. So essentially I want to find the ratio of these four inner components and I'm going to use 12, 30, 35 and 7 sort of as my target sum. So we are told the final piece of information that sounds a bit weird. The fraction of red knights who are magical is two times the fraction of black knights who are magical. So that means that um, let's say that we write this as f. Um, let's not use f because that looks like fraction. Let's just use um, x and 12 minus x. Now the fraction of red knights who are magical is x over 12. Now this would be 7 minus x 
and this would be 30 minus 7 minus x is x plus 23. So the fraction of blue knights who are magical is 7 minus x over 30. So this is just a linear equation. I'll cross multiply. 15x equals to 12 times 7 minus x. So 27x equals to 84. x is uh, 28 over 9. Now 28 over 9 goes into here, but the fraction of red knights who are magical is 28 over 9 over 12. So the answer, 28 over 9 further divided by 12 would be 7 over 27, which is option C. Okay, next one is question 10. I find that in the AMC 10 this year, there are lots of these sorts of questions which are perhaps non-traditional. So they're interesting, but uh, it is a bit of a surprise to see these sorts of questions placed so early. So anyway, uh, 40 slips of paper numbered 1 to 40 are placed in a hat. Alice and Bob each draw one number from the hat without replacement, keeping their numbers hidden from each other. So I'm going to tabulate what knowledge we have about Alice and Bob's numbers and take note that Alice and Bob also have the same information. So at first Alice says, I can't tell who has the larger number. That sounds pretty obvious that you normally can't tell. However, if Alice had received the number 1 or the number 40, she would know that 1 must be smaller and that 40 must be larger. So if she cannot tell, it means that it is not 1 or 40. At least Alice didn't receive that. Then Bob says, I know who has the larger number. So how can Bob know who has the larger number? It means that Bob must have received something where Alice could either only have gotten something bigger or something smaller. So it can't be something in the middle like 20. It must be something at the extreme ends. Now, we realize that if Bob had received 1 or 40, he would definitely know. But at the same time, Bob knows that Alice has not received the number 1. So if Bob had received the number 2, Bob would know that Alice's number has to be bigger. Similarly, if Bob had received the number 39, he would have to know that Alice couldn't have gotten 40, so Alice would have a smaller number. So there are four possibilities for what Bob has gotten. And then Alice quickly follows up with the question, you do, is your number prime? And Bob replies, yes. So out of these four options, um, this is convenient enough. Only two is prime. So that means that Bob's number is two. Now Alice also knows that because Alice, in fact, has all the same information plus her own number. So she would also know that Bob's number is 2. And Alice says that in that case, if I multiply your number by 100 and add my number, the result is a perfect square. So 200 plus Alice's number is a square. Now, if you know your square numbers, or if you just calculate those that are slightly over 200, um, you would know that 15 squared is 225, that's the closest to 200, that is larger. And the next one, 16 squared is 256, that's already too big since Alice's number cannot be 56, that's out of range. So therefore, 225 must be the square number, and so Alice's number is 25. So Alice's number is 25, Bob's number is 2, and so the sum of the two numbers is 27. Question 11. A regular hexagon of side length 1 is inscribed in a circle. Let's draw a circle and a regular hexagon. Now each minor arc of the circle determined by a side of the hexagon is reflected over that side. So I'm just going to draw one of the reflections. 
for example the one on top will be reflected like this uh, maybe one more this is reflected over here and so on now what's the area of the region bounded by these six reflected arcs you know what um, since i'm talking i'm just going to mark out all of them so this is supposed to be completely symmetric if you draw it to scale and so you can just focus on one slice by symmetry. So we just need to focus on the area of this and then multiply that by 6. So I'm going to um, blow this up. Now by symmetry, these two segments here and here have the same area. So that means that we can just take the wedge, which has area 1 6 pi minus 2 times of that wedge, and that in turn is the area of the sector minus the area of the triangle. So the area of the sector is, well, 1 6 pi. The area of the equilateral triangle, you can use the fact that in a, an equilateral triangle, split it into half, you get a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So this length is square root 3 over 2, and therefore the area is root 3 over 4. So put this together, and you get root 3 over 2 minus 1, 6 pi. So that's the area of one of these, and you multiply by 6. So multiply by 6, you get 3 square root 3 minus pi, which is option B. Question 12. Which of the following conditions is sufficient to guarantee that integers x, y, and z satisfy this equation over here? Now, looking at this equation here, um, it is pretty clear that we have to do some sort of expansion to get a better idea of what's going on. Because uh, x, x minus y, y minus z, z, z minus x looks like it could possibly be factorizable. But we won't really know as long as, this, as it stays like that. So let's try to expand it out. x squared minus xy plus y squared minus yz plus z squared minus zx equals to 1. So as a matter of fact, this left hand side um, can be rearranged into something a bit more um, symmetric looking and this left side is a polynomial with degree 2 all the terms have degree 2 so it gives the sense that maybe we would be able to either factorize it or write it as some degree 2 factors Furthermore, it is symmetric in x, y, and z, so we think there should be a nice and symmetric way of writing it. If you have seen it before, then great. If not, then perhaps we can just show that this can be written as 1 half of x minus y squared plus y minus z squared plus z minus x squared. The reason why this works out is that you're going to have x squared, y squared, and z squared all appear two times, and minus 2xy, minus 2yz, minus zx all appear once each. So put together, you get 2x squared, 2y squared, 2z squared, minus 2xy, minus 2yz, minus 2zx. So one half of that is 1, and therefore the sum of these squares is 2. Now, sum of squares equal to 2 is not usually going to be very constraining. 
For example, if I just give you x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to 2, that's actually the equation of a whole sphere. However, we are also told that these are integers x, y, and z, so the differences are also integers. That means that the only way you can have perfect squares summing to 2 is 1 plus 1 plus 0 in some order. So 1 plus 1 plus 0 means two of them are the same, and one of them is one step away. Now, looking at all the options, the only one that mentions two of them being the same is A and D, but A is too loose because it says X can be anything larger than Y, so if I make Y and Z both 0 and X be very huge, this obviously fails. The rest of them don't mention it, but option D says x equals to z and y minus 1 equals to x. In other words, x and z are the same and y is one bigger than x and z. So therefore, D is sufficient to guarantee this condition is satisfied. I think there were some of you who may have tried substituting in each of these. Um, it is probably fine, but um, would take a little bit longer. Okay, next up, question 13. A square with side length 3 is inscribed in an isosceles triangle with one side of the square along the base of the triangle. So this has length 3. And then another square with side length 2 has two vertices on the other square and two on the sides of the triangle. What is the area of the triangle? Okay, now this question is one of many geometry questions you would see. And at question 13, we still hope it isn't too complicated. So there's an isosceles triangle, which invites us to think of using symmetry. Okay, I'm going to draw the foot of, I'm going to draw the height rather. And it makes sense to draw the height for two reasons. One is that because it's isosceles, um, drawing the height also bisects everything. Uh, and the other reason is we want the area of the triangle, so we do want the height as well. Now looking at all of this here, we can actually say quite a lot about the fact that these are squares. They are not just rectangles, they are squares. And so by bisecting it, we can label quite a lot of these lengths. This is one. Now the square below has side length three, so this is going to be half. This portion here is also two, this portion here is also three, and then you have got uh, 1.5 and 1.5. So if you label everything that we can. Now also take note that all the right angled triangles you see are all similar to one another because of the fact that you just have all the horizontal lines parallel and all the vertical lines parallel and the so-called slanted side is just the side of the isosceles triangle. So in particular, I would like to use the fact that these two triangles here and here are similar to one another. If this is one is to half, it is twice of it. So this height here is four. I know it doesn't really look like this twice the size, but that's because this figure is not really to scale. Um, the square below looks not like 3 over 2, it looks like more of 4 is to 2. So that's the reason why you get some things that look a bit off. Okay, so this is actually 4, this is 2 and this is 3. So using the similar triangle now, we know that the ratio of the two legs is 4 is to 1. So in the whole big triangle, let me highlight the whole big triangle that I'm referring to. In the entire big triangle here, the height is 9. And so this would be 9 over 4. So therefore, the area of the triangle can be found. If this is 9 over 4, then the base is 9 over 2. But you're going to multiply by half anyway. So half times the base times the height is 81 over 4. And writing it in the mixed number form, we see this option B. 
So we just use similar triangles here quite a lot. And this won't be the last time as you might already know having taken this paper previously. Okay, question 14. Um, Una rolls six standard six-sided die simultaneously and calculates the product of the six numbers obtained. What is the probability that the product is divisible by four? When I see product and divisible, immediately I think of it as what prime factors are necessary in order for the product to be divisible. Because if we are doing addition, we would probably have to split into cases. But when we are looking for a product, it means that as long as the prime factor appears for one of the dice, that's good enough. For example, if the first die is row and you get 4, you are immediately done since that 4 single-handedly is going to contribute a product that is divisible by 4. Now it also says that there are 6 of them. So there are six of them means that there are two ways for it to be divisible by four. One is that you have two even. And the other is that you have one divisible by four. But conversely, if you want to flip this around, you can also say that to find out not divisible by 4. Not divisible by 4 is either that you have all odd or you have got 5 odd and the other one is 2 or 6. So we are going to find the probability that it is not divisible by 4 um, and then 1 minus that gives us the probability that it is divisible by 4. Alright, so what's the chance that they are all odd? That's quite simple. Um, each of the dice has a one half chance of being odd, so 1 half to the power of 6, which is 1 over 64. What's the chance that 5 of them are odd and 1 is 2 or 6? Well, you first have got 5 odd, which is half to the power of 5. The last one is 2 or 6, which is 2 in 6, 1 over 3. However, this can happen in 6 different ways because there are 6 dice, 5 odd, 1 even. There are 6 different um, orderings in which this can occur. So half to the 5 times 1 third times 6 is 1 half to the power of 4 is 1 over 16. So the sum of these would be 5 over 64. Now 5 over 64 is the probability that it is not divisible by 4. So 1 minus 5 over 64 is 59 over 64 and that is option C. So when you're finding probabilities, remember that the chance that something happens and the chance that something does not happen um, always sum to 1, but more pertinently, you can choose which one you want to find. Because they are just one step away from each other, you can pick the one which is easier to split into cases or easier to split into steps. Question 15. In square ABC, D, P and Q lie on AD and AB respectively. Segments BP and CQ intersect at right angles at R with BR equals to 6 and PR equals to 7. What is the area of the square? Remember, this is a square. So if you solve it like this is a rectangle, you're not going to make full use of the information. You need to use exactly what they tell you more often than not. Especially if you're stuck, then all the more you know that you're probably not using the information to its fullest potential. So firstly, if we want to find the area of the square, we know that we just need something like the side length of the square. So maybe that's the easiest way to go. To find out what is the 
area of the square, the only information that we have numerically speaking is 7 and 6. So I'm going to use this in two different ways. The first way is to observe that triangle APB is actually congruent to triangle BQC. Now, how do we know this? Um, just by a little bit of angle chasing. If I call this theta, and then this would be 90 degrees minus theta. This would also be theta, and this would also be theta. This is 90 degrees minus theta. So you can quite easily see that they are congruent because all the angles match up, plus you have one of the legs being the side length of the square. So this tells us that QC is 7 plus 6, which is 13. So that's the first piece of information. Now the next piece of information is a classic thing, whenever you have got nested right angled triangles. So those are congruent triangles, but these ones here, these smaller triangles are also similar to those other two triangles and to one another. Now I'm going to use the fact that those two triangles are similar. QRB is similar to BRC. Uh, and this tells me that QR over RB, which is 6, equals to RB, which is 6, over RC. So QR times RC equals to 30. Sorry, it's not equals to 13, uh, that's 36. Um, I was getting ahead of myself because what I was going to say is that we already know that QR plus RC is 13. So the sum is 13, the product is 36. Um, you can combine this into a quadratic equation or you can just by inspection see that the two numbers should be 4 and 9. So we don't need to do it, look any further because if this is 4, 6 and 9 then using Pythagoras theorem CB would be the square root of 6 squared plus 9 squared. 81 plus 36 is 117. No need to simplify this radical because you are squaring it to get back 117 as the area of the square. So that's question 15. I'm fairly sure if you got up to this point, or if you make one or two mistakes here but compensated by one or two questions later, you are quite comfortably into the AIME. Right? But there are one or two later questions that are not actually significantly harder than these. So let's look at them now. Question 16. Uh, five balls are arranged around a circle. Chris chooses two adjacent balls at random and interchanges them. Then Silva does the same with her choice of adjacent balls to interchange being independent of creases. Uh, what is the expected number of balls that occupy their original positions after these two successive transpositions? Well, the easiest way to do this is just to start by numbering them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, and then Chris is choosing two at random, but because it's arranged around a circle, it really doesn't matter which two he chose at first. It should be the same by symmetry regardless because we can just rotate the circle around. So I can just assume that Chris interchanged 1 and 2. Now the expected number of balls in this case because this is a discrete problem can be said to be just the average number of balls over all possible choices that Silva makes. So Silva has got a few choices and we'll just look at each of them one by one. If Silva chooses to sort 1 and 2, which I'll draw an arrow in between 1 and 2 to signify, then all 5 of them are in the original positions. So 5 of them are correct. 
if Silva chooses to swap 2 and 5, then you would get 2, 5, 1, which are all out of position, but 4 and 3 have not been touched. So those two are in the correct position. Likewise, if she swapped 1 and 3, 4 and 5 have not been touched, so those are in the correct positions. If she decides to swap 3 and 4, then 5 is in the correct position, the other two pairs have been swapped, and likewise if she swaps 4 and 5. So the expected number is 5 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 over 5, which is 11 over 5, and that is 2.2 as a decimal. Alright, so this is for question 16. Question 17 is a little messy, I suppose. Um, so if we are sticking strictly to AMC 10 material, which means no trigonometry, we would just use standard coordinate geometry to work this out. Okay, so first of all, L and M are straight lines that intersect at the origin. Now, I'm not going to draw them yet because I think we have some information to tell us what L and M are, so I'm not going to just draw it um, in any random way. So point P, which is at minus 1, 4, is reflected around the line L to P prime, and then P prime is reflected around the line M to P double prime. The equation of line L, so they actually tell you L is 5x minus y equals to 0, which is just y equals to 5x. So y equals to 5x is going to be something pretty steep. I'm just going to try to make it look something like that. Um, it's supposed to go through the origin. Uh, okay, it's not very straight, but I think it will do for our purposes. So P got rotated, um, sorry, reflected over this to P prime. And then P prime got reflected over something else again until it ended up at 4, 1. So maybe P double prime here, this is 4, 1. And so there must have been some other line in between them, say somewhere here, that is M. And we're supposed to find this equation. To be honest, this doesn't sound very uh, difficult or even very um, exciting. Um, the easiest way to do this is just to actually reflect P over the line L to find P prime. Uh, and then M is the perpendicular bisector of P prime, P double prime. Okay, so uh, I don't have a much faster method than that using AMC 10 material. Nonetheless, this is already at question 17. So I think that if you need to do five to six minutes worth of uh, algebraic working, it is pretty acceptable. So firstly, uh, this is the line L, which I'll write as y equals to 5x. So if this has gradient 5, then this should have gradient negative 1 over 5, or slope, if you prefer that. So the line P, P prime should be y minus 4 equals to negative 1 fifth x minus negative 1, which is x plus 1. So uh, y plus, so y equals to 5x. I want to find the intersection between both of them, which uh, I'll call this point Q. So to find Q, we would just substitute uh, 5x into here. Um, I'll multiply over minus 5. Um, and after you solve this, you would get x is equal to 19 over 26. Really not very nice. Um, and y is 5 times of that, 95 over 26. So now that you have those coordinates, you can see that P q is the midpoint of p p prime.
So to find the x coordinate, you went from negative 1, which is a negative, I'll just write this using the denominator um, 26. You went from negative 26 to 19, which is a difference of 45. So to get to p prime, I'll add 45 more, which is going to be 64 over 26 or 32 over 13. To go from p to q in the y coordinate, you went down by 9 over 26. So I'll drop down by another 9 from 95 to 86. 86 over 26 is 43 over 13. So that's p prime. Now, to find m, I just need to know what's the gradient of m. And to find the gradient of m, I need to just know that it's perpendicular to p prime, p double prime. So let's write everything in terms of the denominator 13. And then the gradient of p prime, p double prime is going to be 43 over 13 minus 13 over 13, which is 30 over 13, over 32 minus 52 over 13, negative 20 over 13, which is negative 3 over 2. So the gradient of p prime, p double prime is negative 3 over 2. So the gradient of m should be 2 thirds. So the gradient should be 2 over 3 um, and we just quickly pan through all these five options and we see that option D is the one that has the correct gradient. And notice that we didn't need to find the intercept because we know the intercept must be 0, it passes through the origin. So um, we could have verified that um, but there's really no need in the case of question 17 where they give us that guarantee that it passes through the origin. Next up, question 18. Three identical square sheets of paper, each with side length 6 are stacked on top of each other. The middle sheet is rotated clockwise 30 degrees, and then the top sheet is rotated clockwise 60 degrees. If you realize, uh, clockwise 60 degrees is basically the same as anti-clockwise 30 degrees. So the area of this polygon is what we want. Okay. Well, you can see that this is rotated and then rotated again. So the entire figure is like some sort of a star that is rotationally symmetric. So you can kind of uh, draw a circle around it just to see that um, it is symmetric. I'm not going to use this too much, but I'll just draw it so that we can see that the whole thing is rotationally symmetric. And there are 12 evenly spaced points on this circle since each of the square has four vertices. Now I want to find this area not by breaking into many many unrelated small parts. I want to break it up based on the fact that it is well rotationally symmetric throughout. So I don't want to just do something like uh, split up into four quadrants like this uh, that feels like a waste because I mean, the quadrant is still just as difficult to find as the whole thing. So to make full use of this and to take full toll of the setup, um, we can actually split it up like this. And I'm just going to draw a few of them. And there are going to be, well, 12 of these. So we only need to focus on one of these areas. Now, but thankfully, due to symmetry, we realize that this is a 90-45-45 triangle because both lengths are equal and this is a right angle. So if you were to draw something here, by symmetry, this would be a right angle. So this shape here is a kite. And kites have pretty simple to find areas, thankfully. Okay, so um, 
all we are left to do is to find out these two perpendicular diagonals and then we can find their area and then multiply that by 12. So firstly, this one, we are in a square with side length 6. So this is half of the diagonal. The diagonal is 6 square root 2. So 3 square root 2 is the length of this first longer diagonal of the kite. As for the shorter diagonal, uh, the shorter diagonal, we mentioned that it is in a 45-45-90 right angled triangle. So therefore, this diagonal is just going to be square root 2 times of this equal length there, which I'm going to just call um, x, I suppose. So this would be square root 2x, and we hope we can find x. Um, if you remember the cone question from 10a, um, I was being quite judicious to avoid trigonometry. So I'm going to try to avoid trigonometry beyond um, 90, 45, 45 and 90, 30, 60 right angle triangles. So how do we find x? Well, the most logical way to do it is to see how it is related to the side length of the whole square. So here we have x and by symmetry, this other end is also x. We are left with this dotted part over here. Well, we can actually realize that if we split up the dotted side like this, just going to increase the thickness a little bit. I'm going to draw these two triangles in here. These two overlapping triangles. And I hope you can see that those are actually 30, 60, 90 triangles because you have rotated from one square to another by 30 degrees each time. So by rotating by 30 degrees, um, you're going to form those 30 degrees and 60 degree angles. So this is x. Remember, they're all x. And so by the 30, 60, 90 ratio, this is 2x. But also, if you have this portion here, so this portion over there, let's draw another 30, 60, 90 triangle over here. This over here is x square root 3 because of the 30, 60, 90 triangle. So this yellow segment over here is x root 3 minus x. Okay, so now I've basically split up this entire side length 6 into a bunch of x's. Let's write that down. 6 equals to x plus 2x plus x root 3 minus x plus x. Okay, what does that become? Uh, it becomes uh, 3 plus root 3x. Um, so x equals to 6 over 3 minus root 3. So 6 over x plus 6 over 3 plus root 3, which we need to rationalize. And 3 plus root 3, 3 minus root 3 is equal to 6. So x is just 3 minus square root 3. Alright, so remember that x is 3 minus root 3. We have got root 2x as our other diagonal. So the kite has area half times 3 root 2 times 3 minus root 3 times root 2 root 2, root 2, and 1 half cancel off. So you get 9 minus 3 root 3. And last but not least, you multiply by 12 because it is rotated throughout. So area is 108 minus 36 root 3, which is going to have A plus B plus C, B 147.
Yeah, so if you didn't use the 30, 60, 90 triangles, um, it basically means that you haven't used the exact configuration of this figure, right? If you didn't use it at all, then I might as well have just rotated it by 10 degrees instead of 30. And you know that if you rotated it by 10 degrees, the answer should be different. Meaning that if you did not attempt to use the 30 degrees anywhere in your solution, you can't expect to get a unique answer at the end because different angles should give you different areas. All right, question 19. Let n be the positive integer 777777777, a 313 digit number. That's pretty odd, I would say. 313 digits? I thought they would give 2021. Well, let fr be the leading digit, meaning the first digit, of the half root of n. Now, this is also weird. Um, you are used to the half power, maybe. We are used to the last digit, maybe. But this is the leading digit of the half root. So this is the reverse direction, so to speak. Okay, so uh, let's write this down first. What exactly are we trying to find? We're trying to find the first digit of the r root of n. Now n is a bit too unwieldy to manage. I want to have some sort of estimate for it. So I'm going to say that n is 777777. This is 7 over 9 of the same number with all 9s. And 7 over 9 times this thing with all 9s is can be written as 10 to the power of 313 minus 1. Now 7 over 9 times 10 to the power of 313 minus 1, um, intuitively speaking, we can quite safely say that adding 1 isn't going to change anything. Why is it not going to change anything? Because the only way that the leading digit changes, the leading digit is going to be in the whole number part, right? So that only happens if you move on to the next digit. But you haven't moved on to the next, uh, sorry, next perfect power. But you haven't moved on to the next perfect power. And all I did was basically just add on 7 over 9. So if I just added on 7 over 9, there's no way I reached the next power and I made the square root or cube root or whatever one bigger. So I can use this as my estimate when I'm doing all my computations. Now, so firstly, let's do f of 2. f of 2 is the square root of this. Now what I'll do is I'll take out as many of the powers of 10 as I can, which would be 10 to the power of 312. Uh, and then the square root of that is 10 to the power of 156. And we are left inside with 70 over 9. Now you realize that we only need to approximate what's in the square root to the integer part. So we don't need to do too well. We can just say that this is 7 point something. So square root of 7 point something is between square root 4 and square root 9. So this is 2 point something, meaning that... Okay, I shouldn't say f of 2 equals, right? f of 2 is the leading digit. So I should just uh, put a colon here to indicate that more properly. So f of 2 is found by doing these calculations. Uh, so it would be 2 point something times 10 to the power of 156, meaning that f of 2 starts with the digit 2. In other words, the square root starts with 2. Now, I'm not going to write f anymore, I'm just going to get straight into it. The cube root of this. Now likewise, 
if we have 313, it is congruent to 1 modulo 3, meaning that if I take out a 10, it, 312 is a multiple of 3. So now I have the cube root of 70 over 9 times 10 to the 104. Um, you don't actually need to calculate this, I'm just putting it in for completeness sake. So the cube root of 70 over 9, that is still the cube root of 7 point something, and 2 cubed is 8. So cube root of 7 point something is likewise going to be 1 point something. So I think we will just write it as 1 something. Right? So now for the fourth root, we do the same thing. Um, I can take out a factor of 10 and then uh, it would be fourth root of 70 over 9 times 10 to the power of something. Um, and then this again would be 1 followed by some things because fourth root of 7 is definitely 1 point something. For the fifth root, we need to um, mix things up a little bit because we can't take out just a 10. Right? We need to take out 10 cubed. So it would be the fifth root of 7,000 over 9 times 10 to the power of 310 over 5, which is 62, but not important. So 7,000 over 9 uh, is 777.7 and calculating some fifth powers, 2 to the 5 is 32, 3 to the 5 is 243, 4 to the 5 is 1024. So it will be 3 point something. Uh, and then last but not least, the 6th power would go down the same route as the 4 and 3 because 312 is also a multiple of 6. So 70 over 9, 10 to the power of something would be 1 point something times 10 to the some big number. So again, it starts with 1. Uh, and then we add 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1 equals to 8. Question 20. Another die game. This time, um, you have got each of four players rolling a standard die, uh, and then the one who gets the highest wins, and then if there's a tie, then all those who are in the tie will roll again. This will continue until one player wins, and then Hugo is just one particular player. What is the probability that Hugo's first roll was a 5, given that he won the game? Okay, I need to be uh, a bit clear about this. Um, this is not saying that what's the probability that he wins the game given that his first roll is a 5. This says that if I tell you that he won the game, what is the chance that his first roll was a 5? Right, so for example, if I tell you that he won the game, um, you would probably find it extremely unlikely that his first roll was a 1. And if I told you that his first row is a 1, you also find it extremely unlikely that he won the game. But those two are two different conclusions. Alright, so let me write this down. The probability, this is under conditional probability. Um, I'm not sure whether for um, those of you from Singapore, whether you have seen conditional probability yet that depends on whether you've read it on your own because I think it's not um, taught so early in our syllabus. And for those of you from the United States, I think maybe you would have a bit more familiarity with probability um, of this sort. So what's the probability that Hugo's first row was a 5 given that he won the game? Right, so 5 given that he won. Is the chance that he got a 5 and won over the chance that he won. Now what's the chance that he wins irregardless of what he did? Well, I would say the same as everyone else because they just wrote the die that is fair. So this base should be one quarter. No reason to believe otherwise. 
So we need to find what's the probability that Hugo rolled a 5 and he won. Okay, so there are a few different ways that Hugo could win if he rolled a 5. And so let's go through all of those cases. Right, so the probability that he got a 5 and won. First of all, the chance that he got a 5 is 1 6. Now, what's the chance that he won, uh, assuming that he has gotten a 5? Well, if the first case is that all of them got less than or equal to 4. Well, if they all got less than or equals to 4, then it would be 2 third cube for this case. Right, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that two of them got less than or equals to 4, and then one of them got 5. In other words, that person tied with Hugo. So let's write this case down again. The chance that two of them got less than or equals to 4 is 2 thirds squared. The chance that one of them exactly got a 5 is 1 in 6. But there are three possible orderings. Now this isn't yet complete because if two of them got less than or equals to 4, means they are eliminated. Someone else got 5, which means that now this person is going to compete against Hugo in a tiebreaker. So Hugo's chance is now reset because the 5 didn't matter. The other person's 5 also didn't matter. They are just essentially restarting the game. So his chance, assuming this, is 1 half. Now the third case is that there is one of them that gets less than or equals to 4, and then the other two both got 5. Likewise, this would be 2 third times 1 6 squared times 3, and then this time Hugo has a 1 third chance since he's competing against two other people who entered into the tiebreaker. Uh, finally, there is the one that all three of them got a 5. Now, this is exceedingly unlikely, but possible nonetheless. Uh, and in this case, if that very unlikely scenario happened, Hugo's chance of winning is one quarter after that, because this is the game essentially starting from scratch with four players. All right, so that means that we have this rather messy computation to do. And this rather messy computation is the numerator. I'm not going to spend too much time on these fractions, but uh, I guess this is something that if you have already written it out, um, please do it because um, that's the last calculation you need to do before you get your answer. So do it and do it twice if you have to because I think getting here um, makes it worthwhile to, to um, redo your calculation to verify that you've gotten it correct. Uh, so if you did all of that correctly, um, which I've done on paper but don't want to bore you with, um, you should get option C. And we're into the last five. I'm sure many of you didn't um, look at all of the last five questions during the AMC, so feel free to pause the video and look at it now for the first time if you are not too <laughs> traumatized and if you also haven't tried it and want to give it a go. All right, so regular polygons with five, six, seven, and eight sides are inscribed in the same circle. Um, no two of the polygons share a vertex and no three of their sides intersect at a common point. At how many points inside the circle do two of their sides intersect? Okay. First off, um, this just settles a bit of potential ambiguity. Um, we are not going to have a scenario 
where all of the sites, let's say from the pentagon, the hexagon, the heptagon, and the octagon, all go through the same point, and we're asking, um, do I count that point as one intersection or more than one intersection? And we don't have to worry about that. Meaning that all our intersections will only come with from pentagon with hexagon, pentagon with heptagon, pentagon with octagon, and so on. We also know that no two of them share a vertex, so you're not going to have any lost intersections because the vertices coincided. Now that means that the intersections come from two polygons at a time. So I'm going to just try to understand how does the intersections between, let's say, the pentagon and hexagon work. And once I understand that, the pentagon and heptagon, pentagon and octagon, hexagon and heptagon, all of them should work quite close to one another. So let's start by drawing the circle. I will draw the pentagon, or rather, I'll just mark out the vertices um, evenly. And then I'll mark out vertices from a hexagon. Okay, this was uh, not a very well chosen color. Maybe I'm going to pick something a bit clearer, like blue. Um, okay, much better. I'm only going to draw in the pentagon, I'm not going to draw in the hexagon because we can kind of see the intersections coming. So I want us to get the idea of how the intersections work so that we don't have to draw all of the different combinations one by one. Now the idea is that for the hexagon, if you want to know when the sides of the hexagon intersect with the sides of the pentagon, it happens whenever you cross over between two of the arcs that are demarcated by the pentagon. So I'm going to number the arcs, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. When you cross over from 1 to 2, it means that you're going to pass through two sides. But when you stay within the same arc, you're not going to reach the next point yet, so you're not going to intersect anything. Uh, and then when you go to the next arc, you're going to pass through two again, and then two again, two again. So I did draw the hexagon in a sense after all. Not very straight, but doesn't affect the number of intersections, so we are good. Now you realize that for the pentagon, since you divided it into five arcs, you're going to have five times two intersections. And five is the smaller number of sites. So this gives us a guide for how many intersections there are for anything else, because this argument about the arcs will still apply then. So 5 and 6 gives you 10. 5 and 7 also gives you 10. 5 and 8 gives you 10. 6 and 7, 12. 6 and 8, 12. And then 7 and 8, 14 intersections. So sum up all of these and you would get 68 intersections. Right, we are on the home stretch. Uh, four more questions. And we have taken up basically an hour, 15 minutes or so um, from the time I actually started going through. So I think this is with the assumption that we know where we are going. Um, and here I'm slowing down a bit to explain my thoughts a bit. Um, but assuming that we know what direction we're heading in, um, take away some of my small talk and we would be able to just finish 25 questions in 1 hour 15 minutes. Very tight but possible. Um, however, in practice, um, we are going to get stuck on some of these questions because we might not think of the method at first. So um, every bit of time that you get stuck is time that you can't do the calculations. So this is why it isn't too shocking if we can't finish all of them in the one hour, 15 minute time frame. As a student, just do your best. Okay, question 22. For each integer n greater than or equals to two, let s n be the sum of all products j, k, where j and k are integers, and one less than or equals to j, less than k, less than or equals to n. So for example, if you have got uh, s four, 
it takes all the different pairs between 1 and n and multiplies them together and then this thing gets added together so it would be let's say s4 is 1 times 2 1 times 3 2 times 3 sorry um, yeah then 1 times 4 2 times 4 3 times 4 that would be no idea what it is uh, 2 plus 3 5 plus 6 11 11 plus uh, 24 is 35 okay Right, so for example, S4 is 35 and that is not divisible by 3. So, uh, there are a couple of ways that you can approach this. One way would be to just kind of build up, right? So I just write S2, S3, S4, S5. Um, each of them can be thought of as the previous one plus a bunch of things. Right? So this first few are s3 so if i want to get from s3 to s4 i just add 1 times 4 2 times 4 3 times 4 if i want to get from s4 to s5 i add 1 times 5 2 times 5 3 times 5 4 times 5 which is 5 times 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 um, and then i just keep on monitoring the value modulo 3 so that's one way you can do it and it would work um, i'm just going to show a rather interesting way that you can find the closed form for sn uh, Sn, again, um, is 1 times 2, 1 times 3, all the way until uh, n minus 1 times n. So how do we find the closed form? We are going to, firstly, take 1 plus 2 until n and square it. Now if you take 1 plus 2 until n and you square it, this will contain 1 squared plus 2 squared until n squared. And it would also contain 2 times of 1 times 2, 1 times 3, 1 times 4, 2 times 3, 2 times 4, and everything. So 2 times of Sn, basically. So to get back Sn, I should just take 1 plus 2 until n squared minus the sum of squares until n squared and divide by 2 that would give me Sn. So Sn is equal to this. And let me just use the closed form for the sum from 1 to n and the sum from 1 squared to n squared. The sum from 1 to n is n n plus 1 over 2 squared. Um, and then minus 1 squared plus 2 squared until n squared n n plus 1, 2n plus 1 over 6 times 1 half. Okay, so I will now just do a bit of uh, factorization because uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to take out 1 quarter and 1 six. The LCM of 4 and 6 is 12. 12 times 2 is 24. So I'll take out 24. I also take out n n plus 1. So what am I left with? I'm left with 3 n n plus 1 and minus 2 2 n plus 1. So 1 over 24 n n plus 1 3 n squared minus n minus 2. So I'm going to continue this on uh, another page where we have our star result. Over here. Now what we want to do is to check when is 3 a factor of Sn. Now the first thing is to deal with this 1 over 24. We know we don't have to worry about Sn being non-integer because Sn is defined as the sum of integer products. So we don't need to prove that this is an integer. We know it should be an integer. So I can multiply over this 24 and the 24 Sn would be just this. So if Sn is a multiple of 3, 
24 is 3 times 8. So it should be 24s and should be divisible by 9. So I would like the right hand side to be divisible by 9 in order for this to happen. Now observe that if we have 3n squared minus n minus 2, um, this is congruent to negative n plus 2 uh, mod 3. Meaning that in order for it to be divisible by 9, we can see when each of these would be divisible by 3 or 9. Now for it to be divisible by 3, n requires 0 mod 3. For n plus 1, it requires n to be 2 mod 3. And this 3n squared minus n minus 2, as we can see, it requires negative n plus 2 to be 0 mod 3. In other words, it requires n to be 1 mod 3. So this tells us that each of these factors can only be a multiple of 3, 1 at a time. So they cannot be simultaneously divisible by 3. So if they cannot be simultaneously divisible by 3, it means that there is no sort of sharing agreement where, okay, divisible by 9, the first factor provides me 3, another factor provides me another 3. No, it's not possible. The whole 9 must come from the same factor. So the conclusion is that either 9 divides n, 9 divides n plus 1, or 9 divides 3n squared minus n minus 2. So we need to figure out exactly what this entails, but again, this is not very difficult. Um, now n is 0 mod 9. Uh, n is negative 1 mod 9 or 8 mod 9. For this one, it is not so clear. Um, but because I know that for it to be divisible by 3 first, n is 1 mod 3. So I can try. If n is 1 mod 9, then it works. If n is 4, 3 times 4 squared minus 4 minus 2 is 42. So that is not 0 mod 9. And if I try 7, uh, 7 times, sorry, 7 squared times 3 is 147. 147 minus 7 minus 2 is 138. So that's not divisible by 9. So the only choices are 0, minus 1, and 1 mod 9. So that's quite easy to remember. So let's go back to our problem. It asks us for the 10 least values where Sn is divisible by 3. So let's get started. Um, since n is greater than or equals to 2, we cannot have n is 1. So you get 8, 9, 10, and then you plus 9 to this block, 17, 18, 19. You move to the next block, 26, 27, 28, uh, and then one more number, 35. Okay. Uh, so you can add all of these up together. Um, the first block is 27, the next block is 54, and then 81. Um, do your addition correctly. The total should be 197. Yeah, so I think this is quite a nice question, but it looks very much like an AIME kind of problem because it takes a fair bit amount of time. Well, three more questions. Question 23. I understand that question 23 was on the AMC um, 12 practice contest on AOPS or at least something quite close to it. Um, I think this is actually quite a famous problem because uh, if you are aware of Ramsey numbers, just as a bit of a sidetrack, for Ramsey numbers, it says it's to do with what number of um, points do you need such that if you connect every pair of them, 
and you color it with two colors, you are guaranteed to find a triangle or maybe a quadrilateral of the same color. So for a Ramsey numbers, what it actually says is that um, if you have got a hexagon so with six sides, probability is one. In other words, it is guaranteed. Right? That's one of the very famous results uh, in graph theory. Um, the probability is not one for five, but uh, I'm going to take a bit of inspiration from that. If those of you who know Ramsey numbers, you will be able to see where I'm going with my approach. If you don't, um, this still should sound reasonable to you. So don't worry about missing out too much. Okay, so what's the probability there will be a triangle? I'm going to likewise find the probability of the no triangle with the same color. So regular pentagon, I'll start off with one point. Now I want to know, how can I avoid a triangle? Well, from this one point, uh, let's say there are these four other points. Suppose that I decided to go using the same color. I'm not going to use uh, red and blue since my points are red. I'll just use black and blue. Um, if let's say that you went to all of them using the same color, then you will need to use a different color to complete the triangle. So you need a triangle here to be have a third side to be blue. This side must be blue. But then over here, this side must also be blue. So you get a contradiction. Right? Because now you form a blue triangle. Okay, I think I shouldn't be so lazy. I should actually just follow the colors in the question to avoid confusion. So I hope that made sense though. Now what we are trying to say is that if you were to very strictly follow the I cannot form a triangle rule. The only way that you can avoid forming a triangle, once you have drawn, let's say, these three, would be if you say that uh, this triangle needs to be completed with a blue line, this triangle needs to be completed with a blue line, this triangle needs to be completed with a blue line, but you ended up forming a blue triangle instead. And this would be if I have three red edges coming up from the same point. So therefore, if I want to avoid a triangle, I can never have three red edges coming from the same point. I need to have two red and two blue coming up from the same point there. So I need to have two red and two blue coming up from the same point. And since I need to complete these triangles like that, this one must be blue and this one must be red. So now there are two possibilities um, because at this point, nothing else is forced. So if let's say that I completed this with a red segment, then from this triangle here, this must be a blue segment. And then from this triangle over here, this must be red. And then from this triangle over here, this must be blue. Now conversely, it is quite easy to see that if I picked a blue one there. Let's use a dotted one. I hope my dots look sufficiently different from the dash. If I pick the blue there, then this would have to be red. And then if that was red, the one below has to be blue. And then this has to be red. So essentially, you have got two further choices once you have done that. So the number of possible um, colorings so the number of zero triangle colorings is first of all pick two of the four to be red so four choose two and then for the remaining ones you only have two choices so 12 zero triangle colorings out of 2 to the power of 10, which is 3 over 2 to the 8, and that's 3 over 
256. So 3 over 256 is the chance that you do not have a triangle. So 1 minus that is 253 over 256 is the chance that you do have such a triangle. Twenty-four. A cube is constructed from four white cubes and four blue unit cubes. Uh, how many different ways are there to construct the two by two by two cube using these smaller cubes? Okay, so we are going to have to split into cases, and the cases are made a bit more tricky because you have to consider rotations to be identical. So one way that we can avoid making uh, mistakes is to split by layers. All right, so the first layer, which is the bottom, and the second layer, which is the top. And I'm also going to do a count of the number of rotations. So this serves as a second check for me to make sure that I actually get the correct number. Now, after we have finished filling out all of these, you would expect the number of rotations to be the total number of ways to color it irrespective of rotations I want to count them. So that would be 8 choose 4 which is 70. So that's my target. Okay so without further ado let's go. The first one would be if we have the first layer and we take all four and we do nothing at the top. Right, so this is one possible way. And when I say take them means blue, right? So I ignore the white, I just imagine I'm picking four blue squares, four blue cubes. So this one can be rotated such that it faces every of the six faces. So that would account for six possibilities. The next one would be if I have three of them, And then, of course, you know that there are a few possibilities. You could either shade this one, you could shade this one, you could have this one, or you could have this one. I'm not going to count these ones yet because there's a couple more I want to include. Um, I want to include those where there are only two included. And we need to be a bit careful with that. Um, I'm just going to um, append one more below here because uh, I need that additional case where I've got two like this. I don't need to consider the case where the bottom layer has one and the top has three because that can be just rotated over back to the case where the bottom has three and the top has one. So that's the reason why I can stop at um, two in the bottom layer. So now let's picture each of these. For this one I think is easy. You have got three of them at the bottom and then the fourth one is kind of floating. Now for how many ways are there to do this? Each different phase, there are six of them. There are four ways to pick this L shape of three squares. So the other one would be fixed, so there are 24 ones, 24 of these that will be counted. For the one that is with the extra square at the top layer stacked on the middle of your L shape, meaning that it looks like your X, Y, and Z exist like this, then that one Essentially, you just need to pick your origin and then extend in all three directions. So there are eight different cubes means that this would be counted in eight ways. Now, 
Now for these two here, it is a bit unclear whether they are the same. So we're going to put that on hold first, but I would say that for these two, if they are the same, then it means that they can be rotated to one another um, and it will be combined together. If not, then you would have to split them up. So we'll see later how many ways that contributes. Now for this one with two consecutive ones at the bottom, okay, I should change back to the original color, black. For this one with two adjacent, if you picked two more uh, on top of them, you will go back to the first case. If you picked any one such that they are aligned, you will go back to one of them with an L shape. You need to make sure that in your selection, there is no L shape of three adjacent blocks. So the only way this can happen would be like this. And finally, for this case, where the two bottom are in this shape, if you have any two adjacent, you would fall into either the second case or third case. So the only way that this can be done would be like this. Now you realize that at this point, we only have gotten one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and there's nothing else. So provisionally, um, if we are doing the AMC, we can assume that, oh, it's just seven because there's nothing else that comes to mind already um, since that's all we found. Uh, but let me count each of these just to make sure that it really comes up to 70. Okay, so for this one, um, you pick two different blocks of two. So you have got three different faces that you can, um, three different directions. And for those three different directions, you can swap your checkerboard shape. So it would be three times two which is six. For this one, because it is actually a full checkerboard, you only have got two different choices. Now for these two here, you can rotate them around in the same way as the 24 different rotations case. However, because if you imagine it, they are actually two different L shapes conjoined together, meaning that if you rotate it, you can rotate back to yourself. So it would be 24 divided by two because each arrangement is counted twice to give you 12. And likewise, 24 divided by two to give you 12. So if we add this up, six and 12 and 24, eight and 12 and six and two, you do really get a total of 70. Okay, so this is, actually I'm doing checking simultaneously as I'm doing the question. Um, but if you're really good at your casework, I mean, nothing is stopping you from just writing out this seven and just blasting out the answer immediately. Um, but I thought that I could give a bit more intuition in this case. Last but not least, this geometry question, question 25. A rectangle with side lengths one and three, a square with side length one and a rectangle R are inscribed inside a larger square of unknown size. And the sum of all possible values for the area of R can be written in the form M over N. Okay, so let's um, try to understand what is so important about this setup. So the two important things, well, I should say three important things. One is that this rectangle shares a vertex with the square. Right, if you were just floating, there are lots of ways to have it. Secondly, this rectangle shares a vertex with, has a vertex on this length three side of that rectangle. Again, if it were floating, it could be anywhere. But the other interesting thing is that these two have the same size. There is a side length one of the rectangle and there's the side length one of the square. So that caught my eye because one and one. So instinct instinctively, when I looked at this, I realized that I should probably make use of the fact that this is an isosceles triangle. And similar to the earlier problem, I made use of it by splitting it up into half. Now immediately you realize that this triangle 
this triangle, this triangle are congruent to one another. And if we actually draw a bit more, it's a square, so I can draw it here. This are all congruent to one another. Furthermore, if we continue downwards, this one here is similar to those others because uh, the angles are equal and it is three times bigger um, followed by this one which is going back to the so-called normal size again. So I'm going to do some labeling. Uh, I'm going to call the shorter leg A and the longer leg B. So A, B, B, A, B, A, B, B, A, and then this is now three times bigger. So this would be 3A, 3B, and then A and B. Now, this is a square that they are inscribed in. So we can compare the two sides and we hope they are different. We hope they are different because that gives us some information about A and B. Right? And much to our satisfaction, A, B, B, and 3A. So 4A plus 2B equals to 3B plus A, which implies that B equals to 3A. Great, so B equals to 3A, meaning that I actually know what is A because in my right angle triangles, A, B, and 1, a squared plus b squared, which is now 3a squared equals to 1. So 10a squared equals to 1. a is 1 over root 10, which I'll just write as root 1 over 10. Uh, we don't have to really simplify it too much just yet. Okay, now I'm not going to uh, replace all of the a's with that square root. Um, I'm just going to replace the b's by um, 3a so that we can uh, avoid having to look at that um, square root too much. I don't think it will help anyway. So 3a, uh, 3a, 3a, a, and so the side length of your big square is 10a, which is kind of convenient. Now notice also that there's 3a here and 3 here, which means that technically this is supposed to be a horizontal line. Right? The figure is not perfectly drawn to scale, but uh, we'll just pretend that it's actually a horizontal line. Okay, so now I need to find the sum of all possible values of the area of R. I need to find some sort of an equation. So I'm going to continue on to try to use my similar triangles. I'm going to draw another one here and say that this is also similar uh, but I don't know what it is. Never mind, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm going to just uh, call this B. I don't use B again. I'm going to use call this C and 3C. At the same time, uh, there is this congruent triangle over here because this is a rectangle. So these two triangles, they are both right angled. They have the same angles and they share one uh, common side. So I can call this 3A and 3C. Now using the side length of the square, which is 10A, I can label these two sides, 6A and C. The total is 10a, so 4a minus c is here, 4a plus 3c is here, so 6a minus 3c is there. And now I can use the fact that I have those similar triangles. So the similar triangles tells me that 3a over 3c equals to 6a minus 3b over 4a minus c. 3a over 3c is just a over c, so I'll take that away. And then now I'll cross multiply. This means I can solve for c, mind you. Um, this is, a is not an unknown. a is just square root 1 over 10, which I was a bit too lazy to write in everywhere all over my diagram. 
So we'll cross multiply 4a squared minus ac equals to 6ac minus, oops, why do I have b? This is c, my apologies. So minus 3c squared, we move it over 4a squared minus 7ac plus 3c squared equals to 0. And then 4, 7, and 3 screams factorization. Let's try. 4a minus 3c, a minus c equals to 0. There we go. So there are two possibilities which checks out with the all possible values. So c could be either 4 over 3a or c equals to 8. Great. So we check the two cases. In case number one, if c equals to a, that sounds like the easier case. If c equals to a, then this 3c is just 3a. 6a minus 3c is still going to be 3a, and 4a minus c is also 3a. So all of these would be uh, 3 root 2a. Uh, 3 root 2 a and the area would be 3 root 2 a times 3 root 2 a is 18 a squared a squared is 1 over 10 so this is just 18 over 10 which is 9 over 5 so that is if it were c equals to a in the other case if c is 4 over 3 a that gives us a 3 4 5 triangle so 3c, this would be 4a, and then this diagonal is 5a. 6a minus 3c would be 2a. 4a minus c would be 8 over 3a. So this is 6 over 3, 8 over 3. The diagonal would be 10 over 3a. Right, so for this case, the area would be 10 over 3a times 5a which is 50 over 3a squared, and a squared is 1 over 10. So this is 5 over 3. That's the second possibility. I right, put it together, 5 over 3 plus 9 over 5 is 52 over 15, and then 52 plus 15 is 67. And there we go, that's the AMC 10b. So you can see the last few questions took quite a bit of time uh, and they took quite a bit of time um, almost by choice. Right? Uh, if we uh, are going through the questions at the pace where you would solve it, for those of you who are able to solve, let's say, one of these last few questions, you would probably have done it more quickly than what I have done it at. Because um, once you know the method, you can just blush through the working very fast and uh, even if no one understands the working you're writing, that's fine. And we are slowing down a bit um, to make sure that it is comprehensible to most of you. All right, so as always, uh, thank you for watching, uh, either for watching to the end or if you just jump straight to the end of the video, um, please do look at those questions that you were stuck on. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, leave them in the comments below. Um, please do subscribe. Uh, I do intend to continue going through whichever uh, papers from the AMCs, AIMEs that I have time to discuss. Uh, and if you're watching from Singapore, do try out more AMC questions. If you're watching from the United States, do come and have a look at some of the questions from our Singapore Olympiads as well. All right, so thanks everyone for watching. Um, have a good break after the AMCs and see you all again soon sometime.